Did you hand that one? Okay. <clears throat> yes. On two point four C. Two point four part C. Okay, let's have a look. Two point four. We have the gasoline mileage performance of thirty two automobiles. So you have the automobile and um, X1, X is the uh, displacement in cubic centimeters or something like that, okay, or maybe it's cubic inches, cubic inches, okay, and then you have the gasoline mileage, okay, for the dependent variable. Okay, fit a simple linear regression model, construct the analysis of variance table, and test for significance of regression. That's the, the, uh, the thing that's automatic when you come up. Let's have a, just a look at um, what happened. You know, I'll explain we're using the, the rocket propellant data, okay? Let's have a look at the rocket propellant data, okay? So let's put the picture on. Um, that's strange. Is there a way to fix that screen so that you can see the whole thing? That's one way. Okay. So. Let's look at the rocket propellant data. What you do is you, the analysis of variance table looks like this. Uh, it's not showing in this picture yet. So what is it? There are some summaries. That, okay, here's the data. And I've also put this residual output. I've already done the linear regression analysis. I sort of reorient. I just sort of move things around so it'd be all on one page. Here's the analysis of variance table, right here. Okay. There's one F statistic, and if that's significant, here the p-value is 10 to the minus 10. Then that's what they're asking for. So they're just asking for this table right here. So parts A and B of this problem are basically just hit a button after you put the data in. <laughs> okay, part C. What percent of the total variability in gasoline mileage is accounted for by the linear relationship with engine displacement? Okay, that's known as R square. Okay, which is right here in this problem. Okay. And R squared, we mentioned at the very end of the hour last time, R squared is equal to the regression sum of squares divided by the total sum of squares. So if you look at that here, remember the total sum of squares adjusted for the mean. That's what SST is. SST is the total sum of squares adjusted for the mean. So SST is summation YI minus Y bar squared. And we have a shortcut formula for it, too. So if I take this column of y values, which I kind of obscured a little bit now, if I take the column of y values, there they are, okay, and I subtract, you know, I subtract the mean from each of them, um, which is actually nowhere recorded on all this output. The mean of y is not recorded anywhere. <laughs> Believe it or not, okay. Unless I unless the mean of x is one of these x values, the mean of x is 13.36. So I could sort of guess right about the mean of y because um, on the predicted y, remember x bar y bar is on the least squares line. So if I could find a, a, an x that was about 13.36 over here, okay, then I could find a predicted y. All right, so y bar is something around 2150 or so. Okay? So this is to, you know, to recall some of the information. So there's a total sum of squares. 
and that is equal to, keep adjusting this thing, equal to um, this big number down here in the bottom. That's the, of these three numbers of the sum of squares, that's the largest because indeed this number plus this number equals this number. All right? The total sum of squares is partitioned into a regression sum of squares and a residual sum of squares. Remember the picture we had? We had in Rn, which in this case n is equal to 20, and you had the model for means, which is represented by a, a, a real two-dimensional plane. Okay, in Rn. This is the uh, set of all beta zero times of vector one, which is an n by one vector, plus beta one times the vector x, which is just an x column, okay? That's a set of all such things as beta zero and beta one vary. Okay, and then I have my y vector here, and then I project that onto this plane, okay? And that gives me my y hat. But I also projected it onto the line, uh, which is a linear span of one. Okay, the lines were one, 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 one. And this is, so this is y bar times one here. Okay, this point, or this vector, okay? <clears throat> All right, so this is the, this, this, the length of this hypotenuse of a certain right triangle that's sort of sitting forward in this picture is the total sum of squares. This is the regression sum of squares here. And this is the total, and the ratio, this to that, is a percentage less than 100% because of the Pythagorean relationship, right? Okay, SSR is definitely less than SST. When I label these sides, I mean the square length, the, the physical square length of the side. <clears throat> okay, so that's what the, um, to that's what the, percent of total variability in gasoline mileage is accounted for. Total variability in gasoline mileage is total variability of the y values. Gasoline mileage is the y. This is what's called the total variability adjusted for the mean. All right? Nobody says adjusted for the mean because this is an in with intercept model. Okay, in the no intercept model, it is just summation yi squared. All right? Okay accounted for by the linear relationship with engine displacement, accounted for by the model, okay? Okay. So really what it is in terms of the picture, the least squares line, let's have a look at it from that point of view. <laughs> What you have is that you've got, if you plotted all these points, I'm not sure exactly what it should look like. What is the, uh, the coefficient, what are the coefficients? The coefficients were, of course, um, a negative slope, right? Well, this is for the rocket propellant data. I guess in your gasoline mileage, there might have been a negative slope too. Would that have been the case? <laughs> because the bigger the engine, the lower the gas mileage. Right? So there was a negative slope there too, I think you'll find. All right, if you do the work. So you've got some kind of, I'm not going to put the units on the x and y axes, but you've got some kind of scatter diagram of x and y values. For this problem, this is 2.4. Y is uh, mileage. How do you spell mileage? <laughs> Let's see. Mileage, there's an E in there, okay? I guess that makes sense. And this X is the displacement, engine displacement. So then you have then you have some kind of straight line fit here, which you may want to plot. Do you know how to do that? We'll get to that. Here's some plots, okay? So uh, this is the rocket propellant data, of course, all right? The, the line down the middle, if you can, I probably can't read it. Uh, well, actually, maybe you can. There's a blue line here you can barely see. I'm sure you can't see the different colors there. But uh, the purple one 
is the least squares line. Okay, so you can put uh, dots corresponding to the x values there on the least squares line. Just project the, the, the original scatter diagram in the vertical direction onto the line. Right? And so you got as many of these x marks a spot along the line. Those are the points x, these are the points x, i, y, i, hat. Okay? There's many points of the x's there. Okay? The total variability in the x's, that's what SSR is. So SSR is summation y hat sub i minus y bar squared. Turns out the y bar is equal to y hat bar. Okay? So that's still that's the total variability in the predicted values. So it makes sense from this picture. See how much of the variability in the original scatter diagram is accounted for by just the variability along the line. There is variability in the y hat values, right? Just how much of it is accounted for. All right? That's why it's done this way. Okay? So if, if all the scatter diagram dots are clustered very close to the line, you expect a very high R squared, right? Yeah. All right. And the way this was done, the way that I actually got this chart, by the way, and there's some other stuff on here now, it wasn't on this worksheet before. The worksheet was updated. So if you had downloaded it already, you probably want to look at it again. Uh, is that what I've done here is I've made a graph. The x variable is age. This is for the rocket propellant data. And the y variable is shear strength. And I just highlighted all of these columns in this array. I just, I just highlighted this whole business. Okay, and then charted it, went to chart uh, in the Excel. The t Excel toolbar is not up and running here. Why not? Uh, because I'm in the uh, web browser. Okay, <laughs> I'll have to open Excel. Okay, so maybe I should save this to the uh, desktop. You understand what I'm talking about? I, yeah, I'm having a little bit of trouble here. Isn't that the right thing to do? Okay. Okay. So, oh, that's the old one. It was supposed to erase it. This is the other one, maybe. Okay, now it's giving me trouble. I have to close the browser. Okay. Okay, there it is. Okay. So if I want to get this chart that I've got down here, what do I do? I highlight all this stuff. This is just Excel business. And I've, what I have here is the age. The shear strength, the original y variable, then the predicted values, which, I had, which were computed automatically when I did the regression analysis. So this output, I asked for the residuals as well, though I'm not using them here. Okay, I asked for the predicted, I mean, it all gives me these automatically. All right, so I just cut and paste and put them together. It's three columns here. Then I've computed some other stuff, okay, which I'm going to get to in a little bit. But if I wanted to plot, uh, all the y values, okay? For those get, I wanted to get, I want to get an x, x y plot, an x y hat plot, an x this plot, an x this plot, an x this plot, and an x this plot. I get them all at the same time just by hiding the whole thing, okay? Highlight the whole thing and then go to chart and just ask for the uh, x y scatter, all right? So it always goes back to x, so it plots pairs x and y. The first column is always by default to x, all right? 
That's the way it works. And it'll just do it. And so it gives me all that stuff. It gives me... Uh, the original data is in there. Okay, somewhere. You could read it. Okay. I guess it's series one. The black. Some, no, I don't know where it is, actually. I can't, I can't read it on there. But anyway, it's in there. Now, how do I get lines? Let's just excel again. If you want to, um, I just, I'll just finish this thing, and then you put the chart title and whatnot, okay? And then where do I want it? Let's put it as a new sheet so it won't confuse me, okay? There it is. Now, one thing is, if you wanted to print out of this, usually I format the plot area. If I wanted to put it on paper, okay? Some of you don't have to. I was just asked, can I just put, submit it electronically? You may. I'll just print it out for myself. Okay? Okay. I format plot area now, it's black and white. I mean, now it's white, so it's easy. It comes out nicer on paper. Uh, if I want to. Now, yeah, these, these series one, that was the actual data, the original data, these things that aren't in things that look like lines or curves. Okay, the other things are all sitting in a curve or a line. All right, and if I want, for example, to get whatever um, curve these brown dots are in, then I just right click and format, right click, format data series. I don't know why they're not all being highlighted. They are. They are? Okay. For my data series, I want to put a, a line, and I want to change the style of the dot, because I don't want the big dots to be messing up my picture. So I'm going to make them little dashes instead, something like that. You can play with it however you want. Okay? So now that's some line-looking thing. It's not perfect. Okay, you can make it more perfect if you play around enough because that actually was a quadratic function of x, that curve turns out. So it'll actually make an exact quadratic fit if you want. If you work hard enough. I'm not going to work that hard, okay? <laughs> so it kind of, the line kind of bulges in the middle a little bit, okay? Because it's just kind of like going back and forth, it's like, I'm not sure exactly what Excel is doing to make that brown line. But there it is. And so you can do that with all of them. Okay? So here's the regression line, the purple ones. Okay? And then there's, uh, you can't barely see it. There are blue X's in here. Just, you can't see it hardly at all. There's some blue X's. I could make them more visible by changing the style. And then there are also, there are six series here. Okay? There are there are five curves in the original data. Okay? So you can, if you want to see the X's, uh, format that data series. I just take one of the X's and I highlight it. Format data with the right click. Then format data series with the left click. Uh, put the automatic line, let's say. And I can change the color, too, um, if I want. I guess change it to black if you want all black. Make, make it black. I guess it won't do that. Well, it gives me a custom line. Okay, maybe that'll work nicely. I guess I don't understand this very well. Yeah. Oh, smooth line. There you go. And color automatic. Uh, no color. No, I don't need a marker. So. Oh, here, this one. I got you. Excel Maven. Okay. Actually, that's better. So then I don't have any dashes at all. Okay? And that should give me uh, a line. Only it doesn't do a very good job. The last thing that you need to do is you actually need to sort the data by your X criteria because what it's doing is it's doing it in the order in which they were counted. Yeah. So it's doing this line. Back and forth. I see. That would help. Yeah. Okay. So there's the secret to the, to the world. Okay? <laughs> you want to, uh, the way it actually Excel does it is you need to uh, sort all the data by X. Okay? There is a way to do that. Okay? So if I um, go, if I close this and go back, right? That's right, sheet one. Where is sheet one? Uh, left, down. 
Ah, there we are. Okay. So how do you do that? You want to... Um, oh, here it is. You can just do it like this. Z to A or A to Z. It doesn't really matter, right? You go back to your plot of the long... It will be sorted in everything. So everything was sorted automatically. It didn't just sort the first column. It was sorted by the first column. And now if I go back to the chart, it should be okay, right? Yep. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? Okay, good job. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's nice to have an Excel maven around. Okay, any other questions about that? So that's how you would actually get all these. Now the question is, what's it good for? What are these lines? Well, we'll get to that. So does that answer your question about Part C? Okay. What else? What else do you have? How about this problem? There's going to be something about. Um, Find a prediction interval and find a confidence interval. That's what we need next. So I think we're on page nine of the notes from the first notes. Uh, nine and then uh, actually it's on pages 11 and 12 that we get to these prediction intervals. I need to do a little bit of backtracking though. Uh, where are those prediction intervals? Okay, I think this is enough for this computer screen right now. Let's see. In the notes. Yes, confidence intervals for beta 0 and beta 1. And then I'm going to have a confidence interval for sigma squared. Oh, they're on the notes too then. That's what I'm going to go to. All right, so I guess I better give you notes, too. I think I will want to finish up notes one, though, first. So I still have to finish up some of this before you can answer the questions 2.4. Here's two copies. Now, this has uh, inserted in this notes is an old version of one of the uh, web documents, the ANOVA for Simple Linear Regression. And it's an older version. The only difference is that instead of SS sub res for residual sum of squares, some authors use SSE for error sum of squares. And so wherever you see a sub E, you could substitute sub res. Okay, so in this old version of ANOVA, just so you can read it, because it was kind of an accident that got stuck in there, but. I figured I'm not going to copy it all over again. <laughs> it's not that old of a version, okay? SSE means SS res. It's an alternative version. In fact, in an earlier edition of this text, I believe they called it SSE, okay? And MSE means MS res. So error sum of squares, mean square for error. So they're synonymous terms. Error sum of squares, residual sum of squares. go through a little bit of the properties, just a beta 0 hat and beta 1 hat, and then I'll get into the confidence interval and the prediction interval that you'll need for the rest of this problem. So I'm on page 9 of notes 1. Means and variances of beta 0 hat and beta 1 hat. And if you want to follow the text, it's um, page starts on page 20. 
properties. Okay. So how do you calculate means and variances? We're going to use the fact that beta 0 hat and beta 1 hat are linear estimators. I think we wrote this down last time. We wrote beta 1 hat is equal to SXY over SXX. And we did this by hand last time. Equals summation XI minus X bar YI over summation over SXX. I'm just going to write it like that. I goes from 1 to N. I mentioned last time that SXY has this identity for it. So what I have is coefficients. He calls them C sub i in the text. He has some C sub i so that beta 1 hat is summation C i y i because we're fixing the x's. So I can take the expectation of beta 1 hat because the only thing that's varying in repeated sampling with the x's fixed is the y i in this context. So these are, this is just a sum of the constants. The constants go along for the ride, as you know, from expectation, and then times the expectation of yi. i goes from 1 to n. The expectation of yi, on the other hand, is modeled to simply be beta 0 plus beta 1 xi. So this is equal to summation i goes from 1 to n, xi minus x bar over sxx times beta 0 plus beta 1 xi. Plug that thing in. And now simply break this into a sum of two sums. What happens? This beta 0 is a constant. Summation xi minus x bar is zero. That's the sum of deviations about the mean. Therefore, this term goes out. Okay. So this becomes therefore summation xi minus x bar times xi. And there's a beta one, there's sx x out in front. I goes from one to n. And just as before, uh, whether I put an x bar in here or not, doesn't matter. Well, I can cancel one of the x bars. Okay? In other words, I have an xi here, but that's the same thing as beta 1 over sxx summation xi minus x bar times xi minus x bar. I'll recall the trick that we used to allow us to write sxy this way without the y bar sticking in here. Okay? Because what I've done is I've added an x, I've, I've added a term x minus x bar times the sum of the deviations. X bar is a constant. Therefore, this just adds a zero contribution. So this is beta one sxx over sxx equals beta one. Therefore, the average of beta one hat over all possible experimentations was x one through x n fixed is equal to beta 1, the actual true but unknown value of beta 1 according to the model. Um, all right, so that says that uh, beta 1 hat is unbiased for beta 1. Means E beta 1 hat equals beta 1. I'm estimated and it turns out to be unbiased. And its average is equal to beta 1. Okay? You're going to do some simulation in the next second homework where you actually play with this business. You're actually going to give yourself a beta 0 and a beta 1. And you're going to simulate according to that. And then you're going to get a bunch of beta 1 hats because you're going to do 500 experiments of size 20. All right? You can do 500 rock propellant experiments, okay? <laughs>
roughly speaking. Okay, so you're going to get 500 beta 1 hats, and then you can just average all the beta 1 hats. You'll see, oh, that comes out almost exactly to beta 1. It'll still be not quite equal, right? Because you only took 500 beta 1 hats, not 5 million or infinitely many. <clears throat> we'll get into that simulation a little bit tomorrow, not today. But there is a, you could ask about it tomorrow if you want. There is a, another uh, Excel worksheet, I believe, up there that's called simulation. Okay, what about beta zero hat? E beta zero hat? Is beta zero hat, the, the convenient formula that makes this whole thing somewhat efficient is that I write beta zero hat as y bar minus uh, x bar times beta one hat. Okay. So I think the easiest way is just to run with this. What's the expectation of y bar? Y is not a sample uh, from a single distribution, right? Because the mean is changing. So I have, let's see, that's um, 1 over n summation EYI minus x bar E beta 1 hat. The constants I can pull outside the expectation operator. And the expectation operator can also be interchanged with the sum. Linearity of the expectation. Then I go ahead and compute EYI is beta 0 plus beta 1 XI. That's my model for the mean of YI. So it's 1 over N summation this. I goes from 1 to N minus X bar. E beta 1 hat is beta 1. Okay, so what happens here? Well, I have a sum of beta zeros. I goes from 1 to N. That's N beta 0. Divide by N, that gives beta 0 n beta 0 over n. I have plus beta 1 times summation xi divided by n. i goes from 1 to n. Minus x bar beta 1. Okay? Well, the beta 1 terms here exactly cancel because this is x bar beta 1 and this is x bar beta 1. So these two terms cancel. and you're left with beta zero. So this shows the beta zero hat is also unbiased. It is, we also mentioned last time that it is also a linear estimator. It is a linear combination of y's. I think I wrote down the coefficients explicitly last time. You just have to pull out what the coefficients are here, this sum. Play around with it a little bit. I had some CIs here for beta 1 hat. And okay, I think I've talked enough about that. Any comments? Comments or questions? Estimating sigma squared today. Yes, let's finish it. Okay. Let's finish all this variance. Notes 1. Let's go ahead. What about variances? What are the variances of these estimators? I'm just going through a little bit of this calculation. There's a certain amount of it you have to see in the, in the simple linear regression case so that you're not boggled when you go to the general case. There are all these formulas flying around you need to have a certain amount of familiarity just trying to grind it out by hand, otherwise the whole course sort of flies over your head. <clears throat> I guess that's the lecture for the day. <laughs> Sorry.
So the unbiased estimators, what about, uh, and then we'll also, now what about variances? Let's go ahead and do some uh, variance calculation. What's the variance of beta 1 hat? How do I calculate that? How do I calculate variances? Some of the statistical review was going over that. This is the variance of summation uh, xi minus x bar over sxx times yi again. That's my formula for beta 1 hat. Now, how do I do such a thing? Well, my model right now is that the variance of yi is equal to sigma squared. That's also the same thing as the variance of epsilon i. All right. Uh, be, where yi is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 xi plus epsilon i. Epsilon i was given to be mean 0. yi is not of mean 0. It's of this mean. So, y, so yi is just a certain mean that depends on x plus the thing that has mean 0. The variances are the same because I can always change a variable by taking a constant away and it doesn't, ch or adding a constant, and it doesn't change the variability at all. The variability of y, think about that. Here's the beta 0 plus beta 1 x line that I never actually know what it is explicitly because I have the parameters beta 0, not the estimators. Okay? But then I have my, y my epsilons are just these. Okay, if I'm thinking about, I'm thinking fix an x. My epsilon is a displacement from the line, okay, for that fixed x. Okay. And the y is a displacement from the horizontal axis. Okay. The difference, so the, the, the y's, the variability in the y is just, is the same as the variability in the x, in the epsilon. Okay. There's just this constant height difference between the two variables. This is a constant. Beta 0 plus beta 1 xi. Okay, that's the constant. I don't know if that's helping <laughs> explain this thing. Questions about this? I just, just not sure what you're familiar with. Okay, so we have this. And uh, also, we're assuming that the covariance between epsilon i and epsilon j equals the covariance between y i and y j is equal to zero for i unequal to j. All right. What's the what's the definition of the covariance? The covariance is um, that's expected value of y i minus. Let's just call it. Uh, U sub y i y j minus mu sub y j. Yeah, mu i would be easier. Mu j, easier notation. Okay, where mu i is beta 0 plus beta 1 x i. All right, so that's what the definition of the covariance between two variables is. Between the epsilons, the, the mu's would be zero. That's the only difference. But uh, again, since the epsilon i and the y i only differ by a constant, all right, the covariance is unchanged. If you throw in a constant, the basic properties of covariances is you throw in a constant. If I put in uh, a W minus C and a, uh, a Z minus D, then that's the same as the covariance between W and Z. So the covariance is like an inner product, but constants uh, don't affect it. Right? So the vectors are actually not the random variables themselves, but all, but the equivalence class of, ran, of random variables, uh, where two random variables are equivalent if they differ by a constant. So it's a bit of an odd inner product space that we're working with there. 
So this is the basic property of covariance. And the covariance of a variable with itself is equal to the variance. So the variance of a W is equal to the covariance of W with itself. So this is kind of like working inner products. Uh, you can think of the, the variance of a random variable as the inner product with itself is what I'm saying. Um, so it's the, it's the mean square of a vector. Uh, excuse me, the, the square length of a vector is the inner product, as we know in the Euclidean case, of the vector with itself. Okay. This is a similar idea then. To calculate this, I'm going to calculate this. Now, what, what else does the covariance? The covariance does have this property that it respects sums on either side of the comma. It's bilinear. That means the covariance between uh, W plus uh, U and Z is equal to the covariance between W and Z and U and Z. So just like the inner product would work. And also, you could throw in a constant here. If I want to put in a constant, AW plus, a plus BU, I'll get, an, a, I'll get an, an A coming out here and a B coming out here. All right. So there's the covariance. So that's how I'm going to deal, calculate the variance here, variance of a sum, covariance with itself. That's how I can calculate. If I want to take, if I had a sum of vectors and I wanted to find its square length, I would take the inner product of the sum with itself and I'd start doing all the cross products. Here it turns out, <coughs> covariance, the covariance is equal to zero means all the vectors y if I think of them as vectors, okay, instead of random variables, they're all orthogonal, mutually orthogonal. So that's nice. That means all the cross terms are going to go out. All the cross terms are going to go out. <laughs> so, Let's go ahead and down here. After all these properties and all that talking, we have that this is the covariance. Variance of beta 1 hat is the covariance of summation xi minus x bar over sxx yi. And I'm going to, i goes from 1 to n with itself, and I'm going to use a uh, substitution index. j goes from 1 to n xj minus x bar over sxx yj. So it's all set up for the covariance yi, yj. This then becomes a double sum. i goes from 1 to n. j goes from 1 to n. xi minus x bar over sxx times xj minus x bar over sxx. Covariance between yi and yj. That's zero when the i is equal to j. That's the mutual orthogonality. And if they, if i is equal to j, also I have the fact that the that the covariance between yi and yi is just the variance of yi, which is the sigma squared, right? So the diagonal terms will have the variance yi equals sigma squared, which is constant. That was nice. Not all models are going to have that, and we'll have to transform them <laughs> in some way, have to treat them in some way, that constant, deal with that, you know, constant variance assumption. So then this simply becomes sigma squared times uh, delta ij, where delta ij is 1 if i is equal to j and 0 else. That's So I obtained only the diagonal, and I obtained, therefore, summation 
I goes from 1 to n, xi minus x bar squared over sx, x squared times sigma squared. And so, let's see, the sx, x squared is simply a constant that comes out. The summation xi minus x bar squared is sxx. So we have sxxx divided by the square of sxx. So we get sigma squared over sxx. That's the variance of beta 1 half. OK. Uh, I'm sorry. i equal to j. Yeah, thank you. Is that clear then, sort of the technique? How to calculate a variance? If you have linear estimators, generally you can work your way through. <laughs> okay. Variance of beta zero hat, uh, more complicated. What I think I'm going to do is to calculate the variance of beta zero hat is I'm going to refer to the graduate exercise. <laughs> okay. The graduate exercise is to show that the covariance 2.19a is to show that the covariance between beta 0 hat and beta 1 hat is equal to minus x bar sigma squared over sxx. So beta 0 hat and beta 1 hat are not independent in particular. Okay. Turns out, though, that y bar and beta 1 hat are uncorrelated. So that can be used. Um, whereas uh, this is part A, and then part B is that the covariance between y bar and beta 1 hat is equal to 0. 219. This is a. Not that difficult. Just follow this this method. Now, if I use part B, then I can get the and I use what I've already derived for the variance of beta one hat. I can, and it's a little bit different than what I did in the notes. I did it even a different way in the notes to calculate the variance of beta zero hat because um, I didn't use this. I didn't use part B of this problem, which makes the variance of beta 0 hat pretty easy. So if you read the notes on the bottom of page 9, you'll see I didn't use this. I used something else. Um, Do we have to follow that? Can we just prove B first? Yeah, just prove B first. You can do B first. Actually, B is better to do first, probably, in this problem. Very good point. <laughs> That's the secret to 219. <laughs> to be first. Excellent, excellent. So let's go ahead and calculate the variance of beta zero hat using this. Variance of beta zero hat is therefore the variance of y bar minus x bar beta one hat. And then that's just the sum of two random variables, which um, Hopefully I can deal with. What is the variance of y bar? You still have to do the variance of y bar. But anyway, this will be the covariance between y bar minus x bar beta 1 hat with itself. Remember, x bar is a constant. Then I will well, get out four terms when I multiply this whole thing out, so to speak. I get the variance of y bar. Minus uh, x minus 2 x bar covariance. The covariance is symmetric. Covariance between y bar and beta 1 hat is the same as the covariance between beta 1 hat and y bar. Of course, in this case, they're both equal to 0. Then plus x bar squared. You get a minus x bar and a minus x bar coming out. That's an x bar squared, and then the covariance between beta 1 hat. The co x bar is a constant. Covariance between beta 1 hat and beta 1 hat, which again is the variance of beta 1 hat, which I just computed. So this is, this is 0 by the problem. Let's take this whole business up here since I'm running out of board space. <laughs> Getting to the edge. So what is the variance of y bar?
the mean of y bar, you have to take into account these beta 0 plus beta 1 xi, but the variance of y bar is just as you would have had if uh, you had in uh, a sample from a single distribution. It's going to be sigma squared over n. Let's just check that. The variance of y bar over here in a little box here, the variance of y bar is equal to um, the variance 1 over n summation yi. Again, you will apply the covariance. That means I get two factors of 1 over n. So 1 over n times 1 over n times double sum covariance yi, yj. i goes from 1 to n. i goes from 1, j goes from 1 to n. The covariance between y and j is zero. If i is unequal to j, it's equal to sigma squared. If i is equal to j, therefore I simply get 1 over n squared times n sigma squared or sigma squared over n for the variance of y bar. So finally over here, back to the right board, after bringing that box over here, I get a variance of y bar is sigma squared over n. I have a plus a zero term from the covariance and a plus an x bar squared times the variance of beta one hat, which we said was sigma squared over SXX. So that's the variance of beta zero hat. Sigma squared times one over n plus x bar squared over SXX. Okay. Questions? A lot of formula. <laughs> All right, let's flip the page. Now I say something on the top of page 10 that uh, about uh, the relationship between beta 0 hat, beta 1 hat, and, and sigma hat squared. We did mention sigma hat squared last time, didn't we? You said we were going to get estimating it, right? Didn't we mention sigma hat squared last time? We did not. All right, well, let's write it down now. There are three parameters in this model. The intercept parameter, the slope parameter, and the variance parameter. So we also have an estimate for sigma hat, for sigma squared. Sigma squared, the least squares estimator for sigma squared, sigma hat squared, is SS res divided by n minus 2 equals ms res in the analysis of variance table. I think maybe I wrote it down. Just uh, maybe, maybe I didn't. Okay. You, you put the hat over the sigma and then square. You could put sigma squared and then the hat over the whole thing, but it's <laughs> this is easier. Okay? And that indeed is unbiased for sigma squared, and that has, you could re read that on these old notes that you've got um, in the middle of the, the notes too, if you want to see how it's actually show that it is an unbiased estimator. So if we go to, uh, I guess it's between pages three and four of these new notes, it's the analysis of variance for simple linear regression. You'll, sh you'll show in the very last line before it says the F test for significance of regression. It shows the formula. It shows that indeed E M S res is equal to equals E sigma hat squared is equal to sigma squared. This is an unbiased estimator for sigma squared. <coughs> I'm not saying whether that's good or bad, whether it's unbiased. In fact, but it should be 
asymptotically. Uh, asymptotically unbiased or is it unbiased? Yeah. Well, this is, it should be in general, you would want to have at least asymptotically unbiased, but here it is unbiased. It is exactly unbiased. Asymptotic would mean that the bias would go to zero. But here the bias is exactly zero. There is no bias, is what we say. Now, how do you actually get that? Well, this is a similar kind of problem to calculate uh, expected value of SST goals proof goes by the identity uh, SSR, SS res is equal to SST minus SSR, which we already discussed, all right, which was summation YI minus Y bar squared, or minus, maybe this way, summation um, yi squared minus ny bar squared minus SSR, one of the identities for it was beta 1 hat squared SXX. I do believe we had that last time. Uh, because SSR was the uh, reg regression sum of squares. Uh, let's see, how did that work out? How did you get that identity? Did we have that from the notes last time? There's all kinds of identities, and that's one of the nice ones. Um, notes one. I've got the nice geometric picture. SST is just one I minus one R point squared. Yeah, page seven of the notes one, you have this identity shown. Again? What was the question, Shane? Or comment? I'm just trying to figure out where it came from. Where this beta one hat squared okay. this part? Like I know SST is just This is this is SST. Again, this is the SS res is what is what I SSR, regression sum of squares. The regression sum of squares shown on page seven of the notes one. Um what you have is that the, because SSR is equal to summation y hat sub i minus y bar squared, i goes from 1 to n. We've been talking about that, but we actually know what y hat sub i is. y hat sub i is beta 0 hat plus beta 1 hat x sub i. But beta 0 hat has a nice formula, y bar minus x bar beta 1 hat. So this is, I thought maybe I did this, this is summation y bar minus x bar beta 1 hat, that's the beta 0, plus beta 1 hat xi minus y bar squared. This is shown on page 7 first notes. This is the beta 0 hat plus beta 1 hat times xi. That's the y, that's the predicted value of y in terms of x and the beta hats and y bar and x bar. Okay. The y bars therefore cancel and this x bar times beta 1 hat can be absorbed into the this other term. You just get uh, beta 1 hat squared times summation xi minus x bar squared. i goes from 1 to n, which indeed is the beta 1 hat squared times sxx. Okay. So chapter 2 lays out the simplest way to deal, I mean, it's, it's, this, it's very detailed, very complete on the simple linear regression and all the hypotheses for regression models. It's a pretty fundamental chapter to do well. So they can understand, some, because from then on, we're just going to start doing applications, mainly a little bit more theory in chapter three with the matrix formalism. But then it just starts going. So this is where all the theory of is being laid down here for the simple linear regression model. OK, so you've got this formula for S, 
S R, the regression sum of squares. And so from this you can start taking expectations. Because what's the trick? There's some squared things around. How do you deal with the expectation of a square? SXX is just a constant. So how do you, how do you calculate the expectation of beta 1 hat squared? Or how would you calculate the expectation of y bar squared? Something like that. How do you calculate the expectation of a square? Isn't that just a variance? Almost. The fundamental identity, the little trick, is that the expectation of a square of a random variable is simply the variance plus the square of the mean. Okay, <laughs> because this is just unraveling the shortcut formula for variance. Variance is the expectation of the square minus the square is the expectation, and just put it on the other side, and you get an identity for this expectation of the square. So now just apply that everywhere with all the variance formulas we already have, and it falls out. You have to use the expectation of this, expectation of yi squared, would be, therefore, the variance of yi, which is sigma squared, plus the square of the expectation, which is beta 0 plus beta 1 xi. So therefore, e s, so therefore, e s s res, if I do it all in one fell swoop, I get equals expectation of all this, expectation of this business, expectation, summation, expectation, yi squared minus n expectation y bar squared minus sxx times expectation beta 1 hat squared equals, now apply this identity three times. And I obtain beta 0 plus beta 1 xi squared plus sigma squared. Summation i goes from 1 to n. Minus n, again the identity. The variance of y bar is sigma squared by n. We just showed that. The expectation of, of the expectation of y bar, well, then I have to add all these expectations, beta 0 plus beta 1 xi, and then divide by n. I go from 1 to n, and then I have to square that then, okay, which is kind of a pain. Okay, <laughs> so there's a bit of cancellation to do, and that's why I took a, most, of, most of a page on the computer to do this, okay. And then minus sxx times uh, the expectation of beta 1 hat is beta 1. So there's a beta 1 squared plus the variance was sigma squared over SXX. Okay. So assuming I got this all right, what do I have here? A lot of stuff, right? <laughs> Did I get this right? I'm trying to do this at the board. The expectation of y bar, the quantity squared. Yeah, this looks right. So let's see, on these notes, some of this was done. Yeah, this can be this can be written as beta zero plus beta one x bar, the quantity squared. So that's a little more simple to, way to write it. So why don't I just do that? I'm gonna erase and fill in. You can do whatever you want on your notes. <laughs> but this is just a beta 0 plus beta 1 x bar, this guy. So I'm going to write, write that as a simplification. Okay. And what happens is some, uh, what's going to happen if I take this uh, stuff with the beta 0 plus beta 1 xi squared, and this stuff with the beta 0 plus beta 1 x bar squared, but it has an n on it, and subtract, what's that going to give? We're going to get 
just think of squaring it out. You get, get n beta 0 squared. But this is going to give you an n beta 0 squared. So the beta 0, the pure beta 0 squared terms are going to go off. All right? What about the cross product terms? 2 beta 0 beta 1 um, summation xi. So that's 2n beta 0 beta 1 x bar. What about here? 2 beta 0 beta 1 x bar times n. Subtract it off. Cross product terms go out. All right? So the only thing left is beta 1 squared summation xi squared minus n beta 1 squared x bar squared, which means beta 1 squared times sxx. All right? So all this, this beta 0 stuff, beta 0 beta 1 stuff comes out to be beta 1 squared times sxx. I know that was a little fast, but I'm convinced you could do it. Okay? Then let's take care of, and that's going to be canceled by this. Magically. Okay. <laughs> okay. Down here. And then what else do I have? Let's look at all the sigma squared stuff. I have n sigma squared plus n sigma squared minus 1 sigma squared minus another sigma squared. That's nice. So you simply get n minus 2 sigma squared. And that was for the raw sum of squares, residual sum of squares, not uh, the mean squares. Now if I divide by n minus 2, I get what I want. Therefore, sigma hat squared equals E SS res divided by n minus 2 is equal to n minus 2 sigma hat squared divided by n minus 2 equals sigma squared. Not only do we have this expectation, but in fact we have something much stronger, which I'm not showing, but we could show using moment generating function techniques, which I am sweeping under the rug for this course. There's no mention of it even in the book. Okay? It might be a little bit in the references. I don't think there's even an appendix on the moment generating function in this business. So they're just assuming you know what you're doing at this point. But really, it's Math 481. I'm going to appeal to Math 481, which is next fall. <laughs> okay. So it can be shown, moreover, that indeed, sigma hat squared indeed is distributed as sigma squared times the chi-square of nu degrees of freedom divided by nu, where nu is equal to n minus 2. Okay, this single tilde means is distributed as. So it has the chi-square a normalized chi-square distribution with new degrees of freedom and this, the scaling factor sigma squared. Moreover, also by moment generating, fu well, fu yeah, moment generating function techniques, you can show that any linear combination of beta 0 hat and beta 1 hat, beta 0 hat has one degree of freedom, it's just a normal variable, beta 1 hat has another degree of freedom. Uh, they're not independent, but they're they, they are not the same variable either. Anyway, they give you basically two, two directions, okay? Not orthogonal directions. If you think of vector space analog, okay? Then you have the other n minus 2 dimensions, okay? Which turn out to be orthogonal to that plane, all right? So what you have is all the dimensions of n dimensions and uh, any linear combination C0 beta 0 hat plus C1 beta 1 hat is independent, statistically independent of sigma hat squared. Okay? So what you can do is then you're going to get T statistics. Okay? You're going to get a T statistic as shown on top, on the middle of page 10 of these notes. Okay, so I'm not proving this. This is unproved, right? This is well known by moment generating function techniques. Math stat one, okay. <laughs> Okay.
So then you also have this independence further, also by this math stat one. Okay, and that's this. Now we okay. This is um. I'm sorry. This was true here. Then what did I do here to get this? I made a jump shift. Where did I get this? What is? I didn't make any assumptions of normality yet. This is assuming epsilon i are normally and independently and distributed with mean zero and variance sigma squared. Okay? So there, we've added the normality assumption. Okay? So I derived everything up to here without using normality. But then, again, you're going to use, where's the moment generating function technique going to come from? I have to assume some kind of joint distribution for the yi's. It'll be a joint normal distribution. Okay, under this assumption. And that's sort of what's going on. Again, the x's are all fixed in this context. The x1 through xn are frozen. So there was an assumption made here. Okay, so we can't do any statistical analysis, F, t tests or f tests or any of that business, until we actually make this some kind of uh, distributional assumption. And so then also this depends on that. The independence depends on this uh, fact that orthogonality in the vector space corresponds to independence when I have the norm normal distribution underlying the errors. Okay, independent normal distribution. Okay. That's the basic thing, and so then you can construct uh, T random variables and so on. So let's look at beta zero. So what it's going to amount to in order to get the right um, confidence intervals and whatnot, I just have to, what it's going to amount to is being able to calculate the variance of any particular linear combination. Usually I'm going to take C equal to 1 and C1 equal to X. C0 equal to 1 C1 equal to X so that I'm looking at the um, predicted value, okay? Which is going to be estimating the actual mean value of y given x. So beta 0 hat in particular plus beta 1 hat x estimates, oh, let's put x 0, estimates um, mu y given x 0 equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x. Now we see it's an unbiased estimator because this was unbiased for beta 0, this is unbiased for beta 1, and in a linear combination of unbiased is going to be unbiased for the linear, corresponding linear combination. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have put x0 here. Okay. Now, um, so what would be the variance of that thing? I'm going to need that because I'm, this is going to bring in the confidence interval. Okay, confidence band that they're talking about in your problem. What's the variance of beta 0 hat plus beta 1 hat x 0? Well, why don't we just use that graduate exercise again? <laughs> this is going to be the variance of beta 0 hat uh, plus 2 x 0 the covariance of beta 0 hat and beta 1 hat. Again, these variance covariance calculations where I write this variance of a sum as the covariance of the sum with itself, which gives me then four terms. Two of the terms are variances and two of the terms are covariances, properly covariances. Plus x0 squared times the variance of beta 1 hat. So you obtain the variance of beta 0 hat we said was sigma squared 1 over n plus x bar squared over sxx. This is plus 2x0. What's the covariance? The covariance between beta 0 hat and beta 1 hat was negative x bar over sxx times sigma squared. 
And sigma squared is in all these terms. Plus x0 squared times sigma squared over SXX. So there's SXX in the denominator everywhere except that one place, 1 over n. And then you have, so look at th these three terms, x0 squared minus 2x0 x bar and plus x bar squared. You see a perfect square in there, right? So this comes out to be sigma squared times 1 over n plus x0 minus x bar squared over SXX. Okay, so that's the actual variance of that estimator. We know under the normality assumption that estimator is a normal random variable. It's normally distributed with that variance. Okay, what does that mean? That means if I subtract this mean, which is this thing up here, that means that thus, this is going back to just good old probability, if I've got a normal random variable, This is normal, a normal random variable under normality assumption because it's a linear combination of independent normals. Uh, what's the basic theory? The theory is that if you've got independent normal, normals, the linear combination is again normal. by moment generating function techniques again. Thus, beta 0 hat plus beta 1 hat x 0 minus beta 0 plus beta 1 x 0. Subtract this mean, divide by the square root 1 over n plus x 0 minus x bar squared over SXX. This is therefore distributed as sigma times a standard normal variable, or Z is a standard normal variable. And sigma hat itself is distributed as take the square root of this business, sigma hat is itself distributed as, as sigma times the square root of the normalized chi-square. And I said that z in, in, and z and chi-square nu are independent. That's the theory. Therefore, What's going to happen when I take the ratio? This side doesn't depend on sigma, right? There's no sigmas in there. I can compute this. The only thing I don't know is the beta 0 plus beta 1x 0, but that's simply going to be trapped then in, in a confidence interval formula, okay? So I'm going to get a confidence interval in terms of beta 0 hat and beta 1 hat, okay? What's happening here is the sigmas scale out, okay? So therefore, beta 0 hat plus beta 1 hat x 0 minus its mean beta 0 plus beta 1 x 0 over the square root of over sigma hat times the square root of 1 over n plus x 0 minus x bar squared over SXX. This is distributed as a t random variable of 1 and nu degrees of, excuse me, there's no 1 because it's t, t nu, all right? Student random variable of new degrees of freedom. Or nu is n minus 2. Or nu is n minus 2. It is the same nu as the chi square. No, that's always what, that's the definition of a t. t nu, by definition, is equal to uh, a standard normal variable z divided by the square root of a chi square nu divided by its degrees of freedom, like that. Okay, that's what the, the student random variable is defined as, where the z and the chi square are independent. definition. Okay? Okay, so there's all the normal normality theory. So then 
what you do is you make a probability statement saying this is between an upper percentage point and a lower percentage point with probability 0.95 and then you get a um, constructed confidence interval. You've all, have you all seen, I think you've seen constructed confidence intervals, it's maybe I should write it down once. Construct a confidence interval. I'll just do it once and then we'll never do it again, okay? Let's just do it once. <laughs> I guess I did it in the notes, maybe. So what do you do with that? So you have this nice, beautiful statement, okay? How do you get a confidence interval out of that? So here's a random variable, there's a random variable, there's another random variable, okay? The three of them together making all n degrees of freedom. n minus 2 here, 1 and 1, essentially. So beta not plus beta 1 x, not? Yeah, you, what, you, what, you want, what you say is, let's say, let's say, uh, See, my example, I think, on the top of page 10, I have uh, n equals 20 in the Rockefeller data. Let's say n equals to 20. Just to make things explicit, n minus 2 is 18. And this is rocket data. I've got uh, the sample value of beta 1 hat is negative 37.154. The sample value of beta zero hat is 2627.82, and the sample value of sigma hat squared is 92.36. Okay. But, and that's going to give me a confidence interval for beta zero plus beta one x zero, or x zero anything. All right. How is it going to give me that? First, I need a, uh, a probability statement. The probability statement is the probability that, it's, that a student random variable of new degrees of freedom is between t nu alpha over 2 and minus t nu alpha over 2 is equal to 1 minus alpha. Okay? <laughs> That's a very profound statement. That's saying that <laughs> um, here's my t nu distribution that looks a lot like a normal curve. And here is an upper percentage point T, uh, let's put just call this T18.025. And here's minus T18.025 to make it a little bit more mundane. Okay? We actually put in the numbers. Let's put alpha equal, uh, take alpha equals 0.05, my favorite number. Okay? What is T18.025? Actually, I believe I did have that on the screen over here. Uh, T18.025 is 2.101, which is a little bit bigger than 1.96. Right? 1.96 would correspond to 18 go to infinity. T infinity 0.025 equals Z sub 0.025. We don't do too many Z 0.025s in this course. <laughs> okay, it's all T's. Equals 1.96. All right, just to remind you of what percentage points are. And these percentage points are listed in the back of the book, page 553, I believe it is, for these percentage points. So I'm saying that this area is 0.95. By definition of this percentage point, because the probability that you're to the right of T18.025 is 0.025, it's two tails of 0.025. Okay, so that's the probability statement. And now, if I just plug in that T nu equals that whole business there, then I have the same probability statement. So I just go ahead and plug this whole mess in to the middle here. And then what you do. <laughs> is you rewrite it so that the beta 0 plus beta 1 x 0 is in the middle and the other stuff is on the other side. You've all seen it before so I'm just going to do it. So this you write therefore is that beta 0 plus beta 1 x 0 okay less than sigma hat the square root of 1 over n plus x 0 minus x bar squared over s x x T uh, nu alpha over 2 uh, plus 
the estimator, beta 0 hat plus beta 1 hat x0. And then on the other side, greater than minus the sigma hat, the square root business times the t nu alpha over 2. So it's a bit of algebra to, to show that we just do that. Okay. I don't know. In your mind's eye, can you think? Can you can you do that in your head? When <laughs> you stick this between those two percentage points, you multiply through by the denominator. So there's no denominators in anything. That's multiplying percentage points by the denominator. So that square root multiplies this percentage point. Then uh, you multiply through by a minus sign. That doesn't change. It changes the order of the inequalities, but you still get minus and plus on the two ends. And then you. Uh, Put the beta zero hat and beta one hat x zero root. Let's see. And it falls out. Yeah, you add beta zero hat plus beta one hat x zero to everything. And that's what happens. You can't sit off in the middle. So that means that what you have is a random interval. A random interval with center beta 0 hat plus beta 1 hat x 0. There's a random interval contains beta, the fixed but unknown quantity beta 0 plus beta 1 x 0 100 times 1 minus alpha percent of time percent of all experiments. Okay with x1 through xn fixed. Remember, I'm only sampling. I'm fixing x1 through xn and sampling on the y's. So that's, so then if I take a specific instance of it, it's called a confidence interval. If I put in those numbers now, then it's called it, uh, with alpha equal 0.05, then it's called a 95% confidence interval. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, let's take the break. Let's just write down what the conference interval is before we take the break, and then I'm done with these notes, essentially, for the first notes. This is um, – oh, I don't think I did it for these. Okay. I did it only uh, on the screen. Maybe we should put it back. Well, here it is. Let's have a look at the formula for lower confidence bound. Oh. Yeah, there it is. There's a formula up here. Boy, is that of an F. It says M5, which is the predicted value. That's the beta 0 hat plus beta 1 hat x, with x equals to 2 in this case. M5, can you read up here in this formula bar? Everybody following? M5 minus 2.101, that's the T. 96.1 is the sigma hat. It took the square root of 90 of the 9,326. Okay? I think that's what it was. Anyway, the 9,000 thing. So take the square root. That's the 96.1. Then I have a square root, 1 by N. And then I take X minus X bar. X bar I had calculated here is 13.3625. The um, the T eighteen point zero two five by the way, and so then, and then I uh, had squared that, and, and my S X X was eleven oh six point six. I had to c compute X bar, right there, which is the average of K five through K twenty four, the average of the X values. I had to calculate S X X, which is the twenty times the population variance of K five through K twenty four. The population variance, ver ver P is defined as summation xi minus x bar squared divided by n. So I just multiply by n back again to get sxx. So that was a quick look up for that. You can look up some of these statistical functions um, in the help. And let's see, how did I calculate the percentage point? That's tinv 0.05 comma 18. Why 0.05? Because Excel has, the default is a two-tailed test. 
And so <laughs> that's the percentage point, which is defined as T18.025 by most other authors, but Excel calls it T.05, 18. You just have to keep your wits about you when using Excel. All right? So there's the lower confidence bond. Here was the upper confidence bond. I just added the 2.101 times 96.1 times the square root business and so on. So those are the, those, that's called, um, that's the lower confidence bond and this is the upper confidence bond for x0 equal to 2, 2.5, 3.75. So I didn't put any x in, just use the x values that I had originally. But that gave me enough points to actually give me the, uh, well, this, what I've computed now is this black line. Okay, that's the upper confidence bound. Okay. The yellow, the, the yellow dots are the lower one. Okay, and then this other black, these other lines, the outer, and so that I get a so-called confidence band. I'm confident that the mean, that the actual regression line itself, falls between those two lines or curves. Okay for any particular value of x. Okay, so we are done now for the break. We can come back here and look at this picture again, obviously. It's not going to go away. All right? Thank you.